see you all here. Uh, I've been to South Africa a couple, uh, a couple of times, usually on work uh, with UNICEF once or twice, uh, but never with Singularity. And it's really fun to be here sharing about some of the technological possibilities with you. I want to greet also the people who are watching this streaming in classrooms and companies across South Africa and even, even further afield. We're glad to have you with us. If you're in the room, you might have seen on the program that the title of this talk was going to be Breaking Technology's Promise. In the spirit of future-proofing Africa, I've modified it slightly, and while I will be talking with you about some ways that technology's promise has been breaking, I'll also be talking about how we can all be part of a community that is trying to keep that promise. I'm an optimistic person. SU is a very optimistic organization, and it breeds, it seeds, an optimistic community. And I think that when we are cultivating optimism, when we are uh, deciding to be optimistic, what we ought to do is tackle the very biggest possible problems that we can see. When you're optimistic, you don't need to go for the low-hanging fruit. You don't need to comfort yourself with stories of problems that are already going away. So what I'm going to do is try to talk to you about the most deeply rooted, systemic, troubling problems that there are, ones that are getting worse even now. Because I want to authorize you and encourage you over the next two days to challenge one another, to challenge one another's business models, one another's ideas about innovation around these big systemic problems. So given that, what is technology's promise? I want to make sure that we all are thinking about the same thing when we ask that. I've started collecting quotations that take this shape. So this one, you go back about 20 years, you've got John F. Kennedy saying that for the very first time in history, humanity possesses the skills and the knowledge to relieve the suffering of half the world, all of the problems that we have. Big, beautiful statement, full of optimism. Probably not wrong about that second part. Probably did have the tools needed back in 1961 to solve all these problems. Fast forward about 20 years later, one of the world's best scientists, Buckminster Fuller, basically says exactly the same thing. I think, again, the second half of the quotation is correct. The tools were there. Can't be the first time, but, you know, he was optimistic. Bring it forward another 35 years. You've got a gentleman in charge of a $27.5 billion budget, annual budget, with uh, its influence on global countries all around the world. USAID are embedded within ministries of health and education and youth in dozens and dozens of countries. He's still saying this idea. The, the promise is we have these amazing tools. We have extraordinary capabilities right at our fingertips. We have, you know, the computing power that puts people on the moon. Surely we can solve all these problems. And it's not for lack of imagination. Our architects, our designers, our artists, they keep showing us what they think this should look like. It's beautiful, it's green, it's poverty free. Worrying to me, there's like never any animals in it, but it's this, it's this brilliant future vision you can see. But that's not the cities that we build. These are the cities that we build. We keep building these cities at an incredibly rapid rate. All of the new cities that are coming on board in Nigeria and China that have suddenly a million people, they're not miracles of urban planning. They're not like chrome futuristic experiments. A lot of them are outpacing our ability to plan. This is Mumbai, but honestly, it could be Joburg. It could be Dhaka. It could be Sao Paulo. This is a very international shape of, of city these days. And I want to address, I want to see how knowledgeable the room is about the scale of the type of poverty that's represented on the left-hand side of this image. So I want to ask you a question, and I'm going to just see a show of hands. I'm asking you, how many people in the world do you think make their living on less than $5 a day? How many people live on less than $5 a day in the world? If you think that it's one and a half billion people, raise your hand. I see almost nobody voting for option A. If you think there are about 2 billion people who live on $5 a day or less, raise your hand. That picked up about 5% of the room. If you think it's 3 billion people, I'm guessing that's about 30 or 40% of you, and 4 billion people. Nice. So that's about, I'm, I'm, I'm just about ready to retire this question as well because rooms are starting to get it about half right. 4 billion people, it's really more like 4.3 at this point, are living on less than $5 a day. That's more than half of us. More than half of the people on the planet live on that sum of money. And even though there are statistical discourses that try to convince you that it's okay to live on $5 a day, that $5 a day is somehow a sufficient amount of money, that's somehow not poor, we know that on $5 a day, if you lose a parent, if you have a big storm and it knocks the roof off your house, 
If you catch malaria for the second time in, 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 in a year, you probably don't have any financial resilience to get through whatever those shocks are that are coming at you. So you're incredibly vulnerable to fall deeper into levels of, of further poverty. It's not an okay place that we're at. We've set that poverty threshold unlivably low. And something that's very interesting, the Gates Foundation, usually a super optimistic organization, came out with their Gold Keepers report just two, um, two weeks back, two, three weeks back. And one of the findings that they had in there that they said is basically all of this progress that we've been making, decades of progress that we've been making towards uh, eliminating poverty, maybe on the verge of stalling. We may be about to start backsliding on that progress. This is not the type of organization that has typically said things of that variety. And it comes because what we know is that every minute, five people in Africa fall into extreme poverty. So even if on a global average, there are still many people escaping per minute, more than five, in Africa, we've got five people on balance falling deeper into poverty. Now, when you combine that with known demographic trends, what it means is that by 2050, you've got a higher proportion of the global population going into poverty. Here's why. Between now and 2050, we're going to add about a billion people to Africa. That's great. It's wonderful. Your continent can handle it. You have all the resources that you need at your disposal. I'm not worried about African population growth at all. But it's problematic that the vast majority of those people that are being born into, into Africa in the next, between now and 2050, are going to be born into extreme poverty. That's currently the case. It also doesn't have to remain the case. But if these are the demographic trends, if we're adding a billion people here by 2050, and more than half of them are arriving in extreme poverty, what that means is by 2050, 86% of the extremely poor people in the world will be on this continent. I firmly believe that not just South Africa, but many other powerful, imaginative economies on this continent have the wherewithal to reverse these trends. It's, it's for you to prove that that's possible. And let's look, because at the same time that we may have had some progress against extreme poverty in certain parts of the world, we've been doing it at the cost of becoming much more unequal. So these are major areas in the world. We've got Europe represented, China, Russia, US, Canada, and all of them, since basically the dawn of the personal computer, have added 20% to the, the kind of wealth captured by the top 10% of those countries. They become significantly more unequal. And we know, if you're in this room, you probably know that South Africa is actually one of the most unequal countries on the planet. Your inequality rate is globally representative of the extreme end of this, which means that you're actually in a position to be a laboratory for solving the stickiest, fastest growing, most troubling problem that we have with global political, social, and financial systems. You're living it already. Like, that's going on here. So there's, you did have some progress here since 1994 on poverty reduction. It looks like since 2011, 2015, it's actually started rolling back. So it's not just inequality. You've got like a, a kind of stickier uh, poverty problem. And here's the really worrying thing. There were two World Bank reports published last week that suggested that poverty is now demonstrably, provably intergenerational here. What does that mean? Because it's kind of a benign word for something that's actually uh, like structural violence. It means that I can predict with great certainty that a child born to a poor family is going to have poor children. They're not going to escape poverty in their lifetime. It's going to go to the next generation. That is a system of profound systemic unwellness. It is a huge challenge. You're on the front lines of it. And a lot of the technologies that you'll be hearing about, I want you to think about them in the context of this problem. Why? It is not just a conceptual issue. The more we study inequality, the more we come to understand that it is actually uh, like a blight on systems. It is like a disease on systems. There's been increasing studies on what it does just to the neurological development of a person to be relatively poor. So this was a study that took place in the United States in a city that had like a really wide spread of incomes and the children were all at the same school. Poor kids, rich kids. Nobody's extremely poor. Nobody's stunted, nobody's missing school for malaria. There's no other thing that maps to this, just relative wealth. It doesn't even map to like race or any other thing you might think it maps to. But what they found 
was that kids from the poorer families actually developed thinner regions of the prefrontal cortex than children from well-off families. That's a part of the brain strongly correlated with executive functioning. It means they were at a neurological disadvantage in childhood. And we're just starting to dig deeper into these studies to understand what that means. One of the things that it means is that were we to distribute income more equitably, it might actually be a public health initiative. I've been saying that for a little while, and now Johan Hari came out with uh, an article not long ago that also said it could be a mental health initiative. Johan Hari, if you're not familiar with him, I strongly urge you to either read the book, if you're a, if you're a book reader, that came out very recently this year, and it's about the kind of epidemic of depression and anxiety and even trauma and what the costs are to a healthy society of those types of issues. It's super relevant to the situation you have here in this country. If you're not a book reader, he's an active tweeter, he's a great journalist, he writes great articles. You wanna understand that. Because inequality, from what we know, it correlates with crime and violence. It correlates with bad health, stress, shorter lifespans. Everything that we measure to do with the environment gets worse when you have big spreads of inequality. And again, this isn't poverty. This isn't poverty on its own. You can keep lifting the floor, but as long as the ceiling gets further and further away, you're having these adverse effects. I have to give props to Jason Hickel because I do all around the world, but now I'm in his backyard. This is a leading public intellectual on measuring the system's health of our economies and our societies who was born and raised in Swaziland, who spent a number of years living with migrant workers in South Africa, digging deeply into the, 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 the ways that systems are organized that keep people in poverty. What's, what's causing these problems to be so sticky? I would also follow this intellectual because he challenges some of the statistics, even coming out of the World Bank, saying, look, you're moving the goalposts. The way that you're reflecting our, our progress on hunger and on poverty is obscuring that our progress on some of these factors has actually stalled and may actually be backsliding. So he's a really good, sharp mathematician critic. He's at the London School of Economics. Go ahead and follow him as well. And when I tell you that uh, inequality is correlated with stress and bad health, etc., Keeping that in your mind, this finding makes a little more sense. This is just two weeks ago. The World Economic Forum announcing the headline was, collectively, the world is more stressed, worried, sad, and in pain today than we've ever seen it. That's a bit of a downer. Right? That's a, that's a, it's a literally depressing headline. And world happiness matters. Any number of progressive countries are starting to figure out that they actually need to measure happiness of their citizens. They need to undertake experiments to see if they can gauge that level of happiness because that's going to correlate with the creativity that, that charges the vibrancy of the economy, better health outcomes, etc. We also have, against this backdrop, again, a World Bank statistic. In the last 25 years, we've seen a global drop of 10% in democratic participation. Just in the last quarter century, people are opting out at that significant degree. We see it Europe... Uh, long considered or recently considered kind of a bastion of democracy has seen quite a bit of backsliding. South Africa, you guys are doing a little bit better here. You actually have very high voter turnouts in some of your recent elections, like way high 50%, it's like pretty good. But in your younger demographics, like 18, 19 year olds, you're hovering down in the very, very low 30%. You have super, you have a lot of young people opting out of the democratic system, right? Which is another indicator of where you might be kind of like breaking faith with sections of your society. One of the reasons that people speculate that a lot of this uh, downturn in democratic participation is happening is around the, the level of trust that people have in government. I know that's an issue here, it's an issue in, in, in many different countries. This though is a global average and an interesting, like I hope it doesn't represent an actual reversal, but we had a solid decade of progress becoming more transparent globally on government budgets. The public got to know more about how public money was spent year over year over year, and then last year it stopped. So we stalled in what it seemed like technology was part of this. It was helping to make everything more transparent, but then it stopped last year. So we got to watch closely when January rolls around and see if we remain stopped or if we start rolling back. The act of bringing transparency to governance is not a one-time thing. It's a practice. Business needs to be involved. Religious associations need to be involved. Everyone needs to be involved in demanding and upgrading what these systems of accountability look like. And another macro trend when you're looking at this, what you're basically seeing is the punching power, the purchasing power of the state 
relative to the total size of the economy. In one sense, this is the shrinking of big government. Right? Governments, when government's big, it's because government is 50% of the economy. It spends all the money. It, it controls all the things. And there were legitimate grievances against inefficient, bureaucratic, corrupt, big government. But here you see we have perhaps overcorrected. We have a number of economies where the government is actually in debt or where they represent only 1% of the purchasing power within an economy. In that type of situation, who is supposed to look after the environment? Who is supposed to look after parts of the, our planetary system or the extreme poor who don't have advocates in the halls of power? I'm curious also here to, to use a show of hands. How many of you are familiar with the planetary boundaries framework? How many of you have seen some version of this graph or know the Stockholm Resilience Center, Johan Rockström? Okay, not that many. This is becoming the global dashboard for measuring the health of the planet. There are nine indicators that scientists all around the world have agreed to track, and within each of these indicators, there's a safe operating area where we know that if we keep, for instance, the level of ocean acidification below a certain level, or the amount of nitrogen in the environment below a certain level, or, or fresh water use below a certain level, all of our models continue to function. We can forecast, and we can say, this is, this is knowable. And then you start to go beyond that, you get into the yellow area, and it's problematic, and when you go beyond, once you get into red, what it means is there isn't a scientist around who will even try to model what that means. Like we've blown through the planet's bio biodiversity. By, by many estimates, like 50% of it we've lost since 1970. We don't know what that's gonna do yet. We don't know what food chains collapse. We don't know what ecosystem feedbacks happen. And so the reason that I introduced the planetary boundaries and the social floor beneath them that is represented in Kate Raworth's work is that whether you're in a company, whether you're in a school, whether you're in the public sector or the social sector, these are now becoming the standard planetary dashboards for contextualizing the programs and initiatives that you want to run. It helps, it helps all of us when you make yourself and your teams familiar with these tools and start to self-monitor, self-describe within them. It also helps you to collaborate better with some really cutting-edge companies, think tanks, organizations that use these frameworks. Now, I want to throw you two curveballs before I kind of change direction on this presentation. This was a finding commissioned by the European Commission, um, researchers from the European Commission, that came out a little over a month ago. The headline says it all. Everything we thought we knew about urbanization turns out to be wrong. Well, what did we think we knew? If you've watched a lot of TED Talks, if you've gone to a lot of conferences, you might have heard people saying, by 2050, 70% of humankind will live in cities. How many of you have heard that? Just wondering, that 20, 70, okay, good. It's like 20% of you. And, and that was usually like meant to be a shock and awe number. 70% of us in cities by 2050. Wow, how different would the world be? Turns out that the way that we've been measuring the percentage of people living in urban areas is we let different governments measure it however they want, and then report it whenever is convenient to them. So they all have very different definitions of what urban is. For some city, some countries like Egypt, it's like 100,000 people in a really small area, less populated, different countries have super uh, flexible definitions. And there's already problems about the quality of the, the data that they're gathering, incentives maybe to mislead you about the data. The European Commission used exponential technology they used geospatial imaging from satellites and crunched through this massive database and created one standard definition for urban, a density of people and a density of buildings that are residential, and they found out that 84% of humans already live in urban areas. We're already at 84% at a global level. Guess, guess what percent Africa is already at? Shout it out. What percent urban dwelling do you think Africa is? Shout it loud enough I can hear you. 40? 70, one person got it right, I heard 80. 80%, who would have guessed that? Looking at, I mean, you know how massive your continent is. It fits like half the other continents in it. And tons of the time you drive around and you don't see cities for ages, but the rural areas are already drained. We may already have passed an optimum level of urbanization as a species. We may wanna think about the concept of peak urbanization, because there aren't even people out living in the areas we need to protect. And the areas that we're coming and living in, we're trashing them because we can't plan them and manage them fast enough. One other curveball that's like a little bit different from kind of prevailing global narratives is that we actually have wars on the rebound. 
there are twice as many civil conflicts today as there were in 2001. Twice as many. And according to the International Committee of the Red Cross, roughly half of today's wars involve between three and nine different parties. 20% of them involve 10 parties or more. Many of these are non-state actors. With the complexity of conflict comes a stickiness, a tendency to endure. It's harder to resolve when you've got this type of stickiness. So that's all really grim. I've talked about poverty, inequality, overloaded urban areas, unhappiness, depression, planetary disarray, democracies falling apart, declining transparency, crime. Where's technology in all of this? Like, what, where, where in all of this is the magical ability of technology to solve problems? That's the technology's promise that I want to... I, I even want you to take a moment and hear how you answer it. Why has humanity failed to deliver on the promise of technology? I've found that question to be very helpful for some people to discover what their biases are. Because some people, they'll just straight up, they'll blame humankind. They'll be like, we're fallen and sinful creatures. We will only destroy this planet. There's nothing can be done. We suck, right? Others will blame uh, a different group of people. Oh, it's immigrants or it's this religion. They're destabilizing us. We can't do anything when they're around. Or they'll blame the government or they'll blame corporations. Or if you blamed anything that's just some group, you were probably wrong. And that's probably a learning moment for you to explore in your free time. A better answer, if it came to you, congratulations, would be that we have bad processes. Our design practices are flawed because it's the way that we design and roll out and implement uh, these technologies that determines how successful they are. And if they're not that successful, if they're not actually solving these problems, we have a design challenge in front of us. So let me address two of the areas where we've already seen technological uh, rollout have design challenges. One of them is really well described by an academic named Kentaro Toyama. He's not just an academic, though. He runs one of the most successful um, uh, technology-driven NGOs for educating farmers, like last-mile farmers, in local language with like pop-ups, uh, super-customized video. They're very well-funded. They're growing fast. They totally succeed at what they do. But he's also been researching educational technologies on behalf of Microsoft and the Gates Foundation for some time. And what he proposed is the best way to describe his findings is there's a law of amplification, which is basically that technology's primary effect is just to amplify human forces. So let's unpack that just a little bit. One of the researchers that he quotes is nestled right into the heart of the most technologically advanced part of the United States, studying all this ed tech right around Silicon Valley. And he said, hey, the introduction of information and communication technologies in schools serves to amplify existing forms of inequality. Every time I read that, it still seems counterintuitive to me. Like, why would it actually make it worse? Like, wouldn't it just like raise everybody a similar amount? No, it, it doesn't. What happens is, is well described actually in this Time article. If you want to give this a read, they, like, they run through about eight great examples of when bringing technology in has actually made things worse for the poor end of the spectrum. Some of the things that they said to help uh, this logic sink in was if there was a private company and that private company was failing at business. Nobody would think, oh, you know what we need is to bring them a bunch of data centers, productivity software, and a new laptop for every employee. That's no, even the worst consultants would not advise that because they're already failing. But we look at schools, and again and again, we do that idiotic thing. We just try to paint technology on them. Now, if you're already a really switched on student, if you're well supported, if you've got a great vocabulary, you might go onto Wikipedia and learn exactly what you need. If you're already challenged, if you have attention issues, if you're poorly supervised, you might go online and spend all your time playing video games. And then it was worse for you that that was introduced into your educational context because the design, the thoughtful design of how that would roll in to the system that you have was absent. This doesn't have to remain true. When you hear a law like this, it's basically telling you, here is your design challenge. Be aware that the bottom end of the spectrum can be disadvantaged by the distracting and poorly planned arrival of your magical technology. If you focus on that and design around it, you can get, I think, a, a generally positive outcome. And it's going to be in countries like yours where you do have quite a spread, where you're going to innovate on the design practices that help us be better at that. That was kind of more like yesterday's technology, though, just computers and screens. What about the new stuff that's coming out of the pipeline? algorithms and machine learning and machine intelligences. There are some great 
active researchers and advocates that are pointing out to us the risks of encoding our biases and our prejudices into automated systems. Virginia Eubanks is one of the best of them. She's again very active on Twitter. Her book is fantastic. Let me show you some examples of what, what she's warning against because it helps, it helps you kind of see where it's coming from. The American Civil Lib Liberties Union is an organization in the United States that looks out for uh, the rights of the citizenry. They were a little bit concerned about facial recognition software, so they took Amazon's cloud-based facial recognition software, and they loaded all the faces of all the members of US Congress into that, and then they compared them against a huge database of criminal mugshots. And they matched 28 different congressmen to those criminals. Those were all false matches. And I think it's a low number of criminals in Congress. I think there's way more than that. <laughs> But the problem here was actually that this algorithm was far more likely to identify persons of color to be criminals than it was of white people. 40% of the false matches were of people of color. I wish that 40% of our Congress was people of color. Our country would be setting a better example right now if that was true. But it's a tiny fraction, and they were overrepresented in this because they had basically a racist data set. Amazon, I feel comfortable picking on them. I think they can handle it. Um, had another example of this. They just quietly, two weeks ago, acknowledged that they'd been using uh, kind of algorithms to crawl through hundreds of thousands, if not millions of resumes to help them identify who they should hire. That was their own like best in class algorithm to try to find recommendations. And it kept telling them, hire dudes. And they're like, we wanna hire like women also. And the algorithm would be like, here's more dudes. And so their designers were going in, they're like, what are we doing wrong? And they tried to teach the algorithm, okay, if, the, if they're using really active language, like I executed the contract and I commanded a large team, they're like, let's, let's kind of filter those out. And everything they tried, it didn't matter. It kept coming back with dudes because it was dealing with decades and decades and decades of data that was the encoded race, uh, sexism of all of us. And they couldn't get it out of the system. So they actually gave up. Amazon, with their trillion dollars, gave up. So if you're planning to just roll out, roll out and entrust to an algorithm decision-making that pertains to who gets access to healthcare or who gets access to something, stop and think long and hard about the, the biases and the stereotypes that can get baked into those systems and then institutionalized in a way where you can kind of wash your hands of the responsibility that you had for making that happen. Now, to kind of move into a more hopeful direction, I talked about how bad design is the problem. Good design is often based around principles, values. You're like, look, I don't wanna build anything that opposes certain values. If I keep the values or the principles close to the design uh, considerations of the team, I should be able to mitigate against a lot of harm. These are a massive hack on the way that international aid and development functions. They're now a little over five years old, I believe, and major organizations have all promised that they will only fund technology projects that follow these principles. That's almost all the UN, the entire World Bank Group, USAID, DFID, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, literally hundreds of billions of dollars of total aggregate budget are constrained to only support projects that do this. And some of them are kind of wishy-washy, but six, seven, and eight are a big deal. They will only fund projects if you put them into open source. If you're, if you're willing to share the data, if you're caring about privacy and security, those six and eight knock out most 20th century business models, knock out lots of private sector approaches to trying to get a piece of like the health sector or the education sector. And so what does it look like when people innovate within these constraints? UNICEF launched an innovation fund. They had to cap contributions because there was such enthusiasm, even though they weren't offering a return. They were gonna quantify the value of what got built, but they were gonna put it in the public sector. So it's basically like you were building Wikipedia, you're building the digital commons. Here's a few of the things they built. I like that the UN, as far as I can tell, the very first blockchain organization uh, funded by the UN was here in South Africa, Amply. And these guys were working on trying to make it easier for teachers to track kind of grades and attendance and important educational data and verify it and store it and move it around. They've been operating for a couple years. They've saved tens of thousands of hours of teacher time with their system. And the key thing is, if somebody likes this in Peru, they can just copy the tech stack, give it a Peruvian name, and roll it out. 
because that's what's required. When you've got these problems at the scale that they are, we can't wait for Amply to figure out their strategy for entering the next market and slowly creep into Namibia and Botswana and then maybe in 10 years think about Asia because their solution will not be relevant then. When it's relevant, it needs to be spread everywhere. Kimetrica is another organization that got started out of the fund. They do facial recognition about malnutrition. So it's a very non-invasive, respectful way to determine if someone has malnutrition, and then they better protect that data so that it doesn't get leaked in a way that it, it shames the child later on in life, which had historically been a problem. It's not just that set of principles. The Creative Commons Foundation is running around changing policy globally, changing how public money is spent. Here's an example of their victory that's gonna change the entire culture of the next generation of people growing up in the United States. Their $4.2 billion annual budget for creating learning materials can now only support open educational materials. That means like your physics textbook is Wikipedia. It's updated transparently in real time by the whole community of learners and teachers that exist, and it's free for you. All of the public school students, the government school students in the US are moving now into this paradigm where they will be used to managing and accessing open educational resources. Bulgaria did a cool thing similar to this where they said any software built for the government, it needs to be built in public, transparently in a public repository. Imagine what that does to corruption, to procurement processes. It's a really healthy thing to introduce into your sector or your government. This is a fun example because it's Microsoft, not famously open source, and National Geographic, owned by Rupert Murdoch, totally not an open source fan. They launched a biodiversity challenge. They want teams to create artificial intelligence that will help with biodiversity. And they've got a bunch of money to give away in the next couple months for this. And their only requirement is whatever you come up with that saves biodiversity, it needs to go, again, into the open source community so we can spread it around everywhere. That's one design constraint that we really can't see enough of. So we're heading into this moment where everything's going vertical. And the reason that I like to show this graph is because it correlates with an incredible churn. These solutions, these opportunities, they pop up, and then like two years later, they're not relevant. Oh, we would never use that blockchain. We, would never, we don't even write that code anymore. Nobody can maintain that. That's the pace at which technology, the technological tools are kind of evaporating in our hands. We've already seen this play out in the market. The lifespan of a company has been contracting remarkably. This was when you used to be one of the 500 most successful companies in the United States, you would have 67 years to enjoy that position. Now it's already shorter. It's down to 12 years. So against that, when you have shorter and shorter relevance, what you need to be doing is sharing your solutions as broadly as possible, including as many people in their design as possible. This gives you a chance to learn tons about governance, to learn tons about sharing. These are key core competencies that you need to be able to have the agility and the resilience to manage what you're going to hear about over the rest of the course of this summit. I'll be talking tomorrow during the break around disruptions from the social sector that give you a much deeper dive into some of the really hope-inspiring uh, solutions that pertain to this approach to design. So feel free to come and hear that. Because I think if you're not designing in this new way, you're designing like this. You're using models that were for another century, for a different way of measuring progress, and that are responsible for the worsening trends that we discussed before, that are responsible for ugly types of cities. So just to close out, Jason Hickel, again, one of, your, one of your neighbors, says the morally relevant metric of progress is the extent of global poverty vis-a-vis -vis our capacity to end it. And by that measure, we are doing worse than any other time in history. In the conversations that you have with each other while you're here, please earn your optimism by tackling the very biggest challenges that we have, because we need all hands on deck for the situation that we have. Thank you for your time.